we're back in it at the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm Chris Quinn with my co-host Dom DeTola. Just a couple of comics who like talking sports. We're here to talk sports with you. Yeah, and we, we talk about sports, uh, stuff that you don't see on like 30 for 30 or like general documentaries. We like to think outside the box on this podcast and uh, dig into some stuff people don't know, but it's very important and very interesting. To I us. was going to say, there's so many sports stories that are unknown, but they're really important, you know, laying out this groundwork of the sports we watch today and all this all this, I mean, even outside of sports, you know what? We're just going to get right into it. Because this is one of those. Yes. This is somebody that's super important, but nobody knows and reverberates know. beyond sports. Absolutely. So we're talking about Larry Doby. Larry Doby, yeah. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, Major League Baseball across the entire league has retired the number 42 for Jackie Robinson, which, you know, great, whatever. But what a lot of people don't know is in 1947, interleague play did not exist, which means Jackie Robinson did integrate baseball, but he only integrated the National League. Yeah, he didn't play in any American League stadiums. No, he didn't. He played in half of the stadiums yes. in Major League Baseball. So uh, Larry Doby is the gentleman who integrated the American League. And he did it, I believe he became a professional 11 weeks after Jackie Robinson. Six weeks. Six weeks, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was right after... Um, We'll we'll go back a little bit. I just want to say I think the thing that the downplayed his career is his first season was not good. He um, barely played at all because the Indians played. were a stacked team already. Yes, but everyone was so excited by the fanfare for Jackie Robinson that Larry Doby, despite the fact he's in the Hall of Fame, despite the fact he was an AL home run champion multiple, multiple seasons, multiple, yeah. despite the fact that he's a World Series winner, he gets lost in the shuffle despite the fact that. There is no integration in the American League without him. Oh yeah, it, it's it's pretty ridiculous. Let's get into uh, let's get into Larry Doby as a man. He was born in Camden, South Carolina, in a segregated, um, obviously because well, it's South Carolina. I mean, that's the birthplace of the Confederacy. I was gonna <laughs> say like they just got rid of segregation in the '90s. So yeah. I mean, we're just saying. So like, and we're gonna bring this back because. He, throughout his entire young life, never thought that professional sports were ever attainable. No, it was more or less like, I love sports. Because he, like, basically all the athletes we talk about yeah. on here, they're just good at everything and they just play sports. But I mean, for a kid who was born December 13th, 1923, you're living in an America, especially in the South, where it's two separate Americas. Yes, definitely. The opportunities and avenues that you have, particularly if you're in Camden, South Carolina, it's beyond your wildest dreams, I have to assume, for what this guy did with his life. He must have seen America change over the the course of probably about 15 years, which must have been so, I want to say, heartwarming and encouraging for him because it must have been crazy growing up it had to have blown his mind. Yeah. I mean, and for him, luckily in a way, which it's kind of depressing if you think about it, his dad died in a drowning accident, a uh, World War One vet, um, 37 years old, and his mom moves to Patterson, New Jersey. So she yeah. moves north. And that's kind of where Larry spent uh, most of his time as a child, as uh, you know, growing up as a teenager, and then later in life after his uh, playing career. Yeah, um, after his dad died, I saw he kind of lived with his grandma for a bit. He lived with an aunt and uncle. It must have been pretty rough because his mom, his mom and dad had divorced, um, and then he ended up going. I think after he graduated eighth grade to live with his mom permanently in Patterson, and then yeah. that's when he. In high school, that's when people notice, like, hey, this is a true athlete. And I say that because every sport he got into, they were like, oh, he could do something with that. He's really good. Yes. But he was talking about growing up in South Carolina, like, they had no money. You're making your own bats. Oh, yeah. And, like, you're using trees and tin cans as bases. Well, that's what stickball was. Yeah. was no, There was no equipment. Equipment would be crazy. They would make their own balls. They would make their own... And he was diamonds. Yeah. And he was lucky enough to play there for a guy named Richard Dubose who actually coached his dad. Oh, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Right. Like he's just like, oh, here comes another one. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, he moves to uh, Patterson um, and just completely starts dominating baseball, basketball, football and even track and even track. Yeah. It's just absolutely crazy. And he played um, uh, football on a team. Um, that was going to play for a national championship down in Florida. Only black guy on the team. 
and they weren't going to let him stay with all his teammates. So all his teammates came together and said, no, this is our friend. This is an important reason why we're here. We're just not going to go and play. Which is awesome yeah. um, of the team. I just want to say that South Carolina was like, hey, we're racist. Florida was like, hey, hold my beer. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's it's so ridiculous. Florida's but... like, would you like some bath salts with our racism? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, there's an alligator. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but you see teams like this coming together and it being that wonderful of a moment outside of the fact that they should have just been playing for a national championship and it shouldn't have mattered. But yeah, he, uh, I, I found it interesting. He, after high school, because he was, he was a great basketball player, was which a, a lot of people don't talk player. about. And he had got a scholarship to uh, long Island university. And he said he wanted to stay close uh, to Patterson, New York area because he, his longtime girlfriend at that point, who becomes his wife of, I think 60 years. Yeah, I mean, they were together forever, it seemed um, like. He said that he wanted to stay close to her, and I thought that was one of those things that's a true testament to his character. And he was playing, you know, basketball for the Harlem Renaissance and, um, you know, the New York or Newark, Newark, New Jersey Eagles with uh, another Hall of Famer and another guy who was an early black player in the National League, Monty Irvin. Who we're going to, he's going to come back in uh, this yeah. story. Th just going to come all the way back. But uh, I want to talk about his first uh, thing in with the New York, Newark. I, I'm, I'm always going to say New York. I know. And you say it too, and it's just a reflex. But he actually signed up as a different name. Larry Walker. I love that. Who's another like, Hall of Famer. Is he towering white home guy. runs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it was so interesting so he could keep his am amateur eligibility with college and all of that and they're yeah. just like yeah that'll work for us oh exactly it's just like hey uh here's a fake birth certificate like we don't care that you're black just I, don't tell people your real name I, what i read is i don't think they even had to check that all they said was yeah he's a guy from california yeah they just shrugged their shoulders <laughs> like okay can, can he play <laughs> okay okay <laughs> so he's he's on the path to become um, a starting player in this Negro uh, Major League Baseball League. Mm -hmm. And this is 42, I believe. Yeah, 1942. Um, and then... Did you read anything about the Josh Gibson story when he was with the Eagles? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's his first at-bat. Yeah, because uh, Josh Gibson's like, all right, Rook, we're going to see if you can hit a fastball. And then Dobie singles. You know, a great left-handed hitter, Larry yes. Dobie. And then he's like, all right, we're going to find out if you can hit a curveball. Hits, hits another, gets another base knock. And then the next at bat, he comes up and he's like, we're going to see what happens when we knock you down. So he gets a brush back pitch, falls down, they throw him another pitch, and he hits another single. And he hits another single. <laughs> I love it. Oh, man. Yeah, that was a great first. That must have been just like a great first game looking back on it. You know what I mean? Right? Josh Gibson is such a huge member of this tribe of guys that, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, God, it, it, there's so many little, little spider webs with these guys playing together in the Negro league and then becoming, you know, mm -hmm. who they were in the, in the major league baseball. But because of his age in 1943, he yep. goes into the Navy. Yep. So, uh, 43 becomes 18 eligible for drafts. Yeah. So. And, uh, while he was in the Navy, he was still playing on baseball teams, you know, you know, traveling around and everything. Yeah. And, uh, hitting over 300, which uh, just completely kicking ass. And uh, it was at this time that he finally starts to hear about Jackie Robinson and Jackie Robinson talking with Branch Rickey and the Dodgers looking to integrate Major League Baseball. And it had to have been so, like, mind-bendingly crazy for him to be like, oh, my God, this this could happen. Like, not only for black people, but this could happen for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For And it's such a crazy thought that, think that this could happen for anybody he, i think he said that he heard it on um the military radio mm -hmm. that uh jackie robinson was actually going to sign a minor league contract with the with montreal yeah he said at that point he was just like wow this could really change like coming out out of world war ii the world could really change exactly and he met while he was in the navy uh, mickey vernon of the washington senators um i believe that french that was the senators uh installment that ended up becoming the twins but uh he had told their owner clark griffith there's this guy that i'm serving with who's a really good baseball player would you be interested yeah the the rumor started to go around that like hey this guy's a really good place baseball player yeah and then people would say well what's wrong with him and then they would say well he's black 
What a ridiculous I know, right? Thing. Man, this guy's really good. Oh, what's wrong with him? Is he like addicted to smack? Does he like killing people? No, he's just black. Yeah, no, that's it. I can't even imagine living what? in a world like that. Oh, it's insane. He'll be one of the greatest hitters on your team, and we'll get into this. He'll be a great outfielder, but you know what? I, it just His color of his skin is different than the color of our skin. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous, and he has so much blowback when he finally starts to integrate this American League that you see it's... It's pretty, it's pretty fucked up. Oh, it's but completely. While he was in the Navy, I did want to mention that he oh, eventually yes. married his wife, Helen. Yes, he so, did. Yep. Um, like he, we were talking about earlier, his long love of his life. And uh, in addition to playing for the Eagles, he played for the uh, San Juan Senators out in Puerto Rico because obviously it doesn't matter if you can play or not. You yeah, know, I was going to say it seemed like because this was right before um, – he became an Indian. I think he just like went and played summer ball with them. Yeah, and he hit 360 and was an all-star. I was just going to say, mean, he like... always was hitting over 300. You know what I mean? And especially early in this career up until injuries kind of hamper it. But like 50, there's just like so many years that he has over 320, essentially. Yeah, I mean, he was just a great all-around player. And in 1946, um, the Newark Eagles uh, beat Satchel Paige and the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro League World Series. I thought that was so interesting. And, and you know what? Satchel will come back later. Too. Oh, Satchel comes back. But, I mean, in that, in the seven games, he hit 372 with a dinger, five RBIs, and three stolen bases. Yeah, so he pretty much was the star of that Newark Eagles team against um, this – People think that Satchel Paige was the greatest Negro League baseball player ever and one of the greatest of that era. And I think Satchel was like 37 at that time. So we look at how yeah. young Larry Doby Larry is, Doby now. is. Like I think Satchel was almost like twice his, his age. And it's weird because he would say things, Doby would say things like, I never dreamed that far ahead as far as playing in Major League Baseball because the idea that you could desegregate a game based on a gentleman's agreement and teams owned by old white men who want nothing to do with people who are just like you. I mean, it had to have been, especially someone who grew up in the segregated South yep. for most of his life, it had to have just been like, is this, is this happening? Like, is this reality? It's like that kid who gets drugged up and goes to the dentist. Like, is this real life? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just like looking off, but you, you, this happened because, and we've brought him up on previous episode, uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis dies in 44. Yeah. And he was a notorious racist, sexist, just all around awesome dude. Just a man of his time. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just like kind of ridiculous because the new commissioner comes in and pretty much is like, no, we can obviously integrate these guys who should be yeah, and top baseball players. Everybody likes to laud Branch Rickey for desegregating baseball, and he deserves credit, but um, Bill Veck, the Indians owner at the time, who had seen Doby um, and had heard about him from the uh, Great Lakes Naval Academy, and even the Dodgers liked him. Even he was on Branch Rickey's radar. Yep. He was on that short list of people that he wanted and thought could you know, integrate baseball. When Bill Veck heard about him, and Bill Veck was a very forward-thinking person. Like, everyone wants to associate, you know, Eddie Goodell, the little person that he sent to bat. All of the fans, you know, when he was owning the Browns, you know, making decisions for a game. You know, all the showmanship they always focus on, all the wackiness. But he was a guy so far ahead of his time who thought about the fans and said, I think I can improve the product on the field if we let good people play who haven't played before. <laughs> yeah, no, like literally that was it. I heard that Vec went to um, Kennesaw Mountain Landis in 42 about integrating baseball, and he was just like, no, no. And then, like I said, in 44 when he died, that's when he was just like, oh, this can start really happening. And that's when you see guys start getting into the minors, guys start signing, you know. And and uh, Doby wasn't a minor league guy either. He kept playing for the Newark Eagles. He wasn't like Jackie Robinson coming exactly. up through the Dodgers system. Vec had a very sp different but specific plan in mind for him because he was a little bit younger than Jackie when he came up. Robinson was, you know, maybe even pushing 30 when he came up for the Dodgers. Yeah. But um, an interesting thing about why he went to the Indians and went with Vec is the thought was, is there was a woman named uh, Effa Manley who was a business owner for the Eagles. She assumed because he's from New Jersey, he's playing in Newark, that the team with the inside track to get him was the Yankees. 
Yes. And that was kind of the thought of everyone else. It's like, oh, the Dodgers are going to do it. Well, then the Yankees are going to do it. Yes. But it just never ended up happening because what Vec did was he paid the Eagles $15,000 for him and then another five once uh, Dobie was with the Indians for two 30 do- days. Two Dobie, yeah. Yeah, two Dobie. Or two, two uh, the Eagles. Something <laughs> I saw, though, was that Branch Rickey um, – declined or whoever was paying declined to pay that kind of fee for Jackie Robinson. Yeah. And they kind of were like, why would we pay? You're not a professional team. Exactly. And Bill Veck was more like, hey, you're, you are a professional team. That's why we're going to come in and pay. And it was such a different attitude towards these players. And it, it was it's almost like what uh, teams do with uh, particularly Japanese professional baseball players yes. now is like, not only do you have to pay the player once he's with you, but you have to pay these teams to negotiate with them off the bat. And that is nothing to do with whether or not they sign with you, but you have to pay them to talk to her for their time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, at that point, Doby was just absolutely raking. I mean, he was hitting four fifteen with 14 homers with the Eagles before Vec decides that summer, six weeks after Jackie Robinson makes his debut with the Dodgers. Yep. On uh, July 5th, um, Doby was escorted by plainclothes officers and uh, became a member of the Indians. Got to talk about this first game because it's such a such a ridiculous series of events. It is. It really is. So uh, they're playing the White Sox. Yes, they are. And they go out to throw the ball around like you do on any before any you game. You play catch. You, you play warm catch. up. You yeah. do long toss. You know, out in the out on the field. You before also a game. chat with each other and try and yeah. calm down. I bet and just like yeah, whatever, blah blah blah. You know what I mean? It's like, like how are the wife and kids? Or yeah. like, man, did you bang that chick at the bar last night? Exactly. You know, just you know, bullshitting. We don't know what to get them for their wedding present. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so nobody's interacting with Larry Doby. Yeah, and that. I'm not surprised, but it's still sad to read about and yes. hear him talk about it because he had said something. I walked down the line the first time, stuck out my hand, and very few hands came back in return. Most had cold fish hand sh- handshakes along with a look that said, you don't belong here. And the only guy who came out and played catch with him and even talked to him that first time was Joe Gordon. Their second baseman. Their Hall of Fame second baseman, Hall yes. Fame. I mean, this was a guy. And the thing was with Doby, un- much like Jackie Robinson, when he came to the majors, he had to switch positions. Yes. Because Doby was a middle infielder. He was a second baseman shortstop. And at that time, Cleveland had Joe Gordon playing second base and Lou Boudreau playing shortstop and managing the team. Mm-hmm. So he really he's a guy without out of position, a guy, a different skin color at a very – messed up time in American history and on a really good stacked Indians team, which is very weird to say. So he might not even get any playing time. Yeah. Well, he doesn't in his first year. No, he doesn't. He, he basically, you know, his debut season is him just kind of getting acclimated to what a shit show. Everything is. (laughs) He was pinch hitting and never played second, which was, I mean, his, his position. Yeah. And you know, even though, there was a guy already at his position. Him and Joe Gordon were friends until they both died. He said it was his one of his best friends, if not his best friend, from that team. And that's, I mean, it's such a moment where he tries to, and it's not even like they're hazing a rookie. That's no. something. It's it's the complete, almost opposite of that, because it's not like they're like, ah, you're going to be a member of this team. They're like, there was some strong N words dropped into oh, um, his face with the hard R. Yes, <laughs> like- and. So let's get into, so the first time he tries to play, they put him at first base. Yeah, and he doesn't even have a mitt. He doesn't have a mitt because first baseman mitts are bigger, obviously. Yeah. And, and so he goes and asks their regular, for the Indians' regular first baseman if he could borrow his mitt. And his response is, I'm not going to lend my mitt to an N-word. Yeah. Which obviously says to him and is so ridiculous from a teammate that it's horrible it's hard to think that he could stick around i mean everyone lauds jackie robinson for his poise and his ability to take shit yeah someone else is doing it in other cities and other states you think larry doby was warmly greeted in places like boston or washington or st louis and he always he would always talk about i always played the best 
in Washington and St. Louis because I knew that those crowds just hated <laughs> the fact that I was black and I was kicking their asses. So we had to borrow a mitt from the White Sox first baseman. Yeah. So that's how ridiculous they were essentially switching mitts, you know. And, you know, while he did come up on July 5th, um, the next day, and he struck out in his only pinch hitting yeah, at Yeah, in his pinch hitting at bat. The next day in Chicago at Comiskey Park, July 6th, um, Doby starts the second game of the doubleheader. Yeah, that's... and. That's such a momentous thing to because Jackie Robinson, t- for all for all of the kudos that people give him, you're only integrating half the league. I mean, yeah, you're the first player, but you're not going to Comiskey Park. You're yeah, not yeah. you're not going to Municipal Stadium because the schedule doesn't do that. No, some some other guy is having to take the heat off of you in these other cities well that's the thing about retiring jackie robinson's number throughout the whole league is some people thought like it should have been 14 in the american league and you know what i mean so but it's it's tough because he took so much of this racist ridiculous rhetoric thrown at him and and, nobody ever talks about him and nobody gives him the credit for it and people probably don't even know who the hell he is no outside of maybe cleveland and maybe chicago who he later played for is that he's almost lost to history and he did the same thing that jackie robinson did yes and that's what makes the whole thing just so sad but in that first that second game of the doubleheader he finally got his first hit and he finally got an rbi and he showed everyone i can play this game yep I might not have a position right now, and they don't not know what to do with me, but I've proved myself. And he was still taking crap from Rogers Hornsby, who's, you know, a man of his time, let's call him. <laughs> he said, uh, Bill Veck did the Negro race no favor when it came to signing Larry Doby. I thought that was so ridiculously messed up. So he's referencing this first season where you can just see he's just doesn't have a place on the, on the team. And, and I feel like Roger Hornsby should know that and identify the fact that, Oh, I'm sure he knew it. I'm just thinking that he's a man of his time. time. Just a (laughs) piece of shit. There you go. (laughs) No, literally though, because like what, what other things could you see other than holding him down for his skin color? There's, there's none. There's absolutely no reason. And the cool thing about this, um, when I was researching it, is he talked with Larry, talked with Jackie Robinson basically every day. Yeah. Like talked about all their struggles, talked about all their issues. I'm sure the conversations were like, oh man, we were. Jackie Robinson was probably, man, we were in Cincinnati today. There were some really big pieces of shit in the stadium. Doby was probably like. You're talking about Cincinnati. I had to go play at Fenway yesterday. I was just going to say it. <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? Or like, oh, man, I had to play. We had to play the St. Louis Browns. Dear God, that city's racist. Yeah. Well, I mean, he said him and Jackie talked about what their reaction to this blatant racism should be, not just from the fans, but from opposite players. Yeah. It, and even teammates. Teammates. Even teammates. And that's I know we've talked about this on the podcast before, but like sports Despite no matter what's going on in society, you know, despite what era it is, sports has that leveling stick. And because there's teammates and, you know, a community within the team, you would think that it's where everybody just says, this guy's my teammate. I don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like this guy, we're we're in day in, day out, eight months of the year. He's family. I don't care who he is, where he's from, you know, what his ethnic background is like. This guy's my teammate, and to read all this, it's just like, God damn. Yeah. But even, but uh, let me say this: even from opposite um, teams, to think how unprofessional they would be. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. Because, and then we look back at his high school football team, who showed this, you know, yeah. amazing way to stand up to racism, and like literally, these professional baseball players can't even do it on his own team. On his own team. I mean, granted, there are always. No matter what walk of life it is, there are always decent people like a Joe Gordon or like a Pee Wee Reese for Jackie Robinson. I was going to say, know? there's yeah, there's always, yeah. There's always someone who just says, I don't give a shit. Can yeah. you play? Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> We're here to play baseball, not whatever else. Exactly. And uh, so 47's over. He's a bench player. He's a role player. But, you know, breaking every barrier in the American League. Yep. Just like Jackie Robinson did in the National League. 
1948, the Indians kind of have a plan for him. Well, let's talk about... You want to talk about spring training about in, spring. Uh, in Tucson, Arizona? Because that's where we're recording right now. Tucson, Arizona at Angle Studios. See yourself. It's just one studio. God damn it, Ty. <laughs> um, but he was denied entry to the Santa Rita Hotel. Yes. Um, he, he ends up being able to go in later. Uh, but they say he can't use, like, the elevators. This is how ridiculous your shit is. God, Tucson, get your shit together. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I think at this point, Satchel Page is with him. Satchel Page and Minnie Minoso. And who, Minnie Minoso. Uh, who is Afro-Cuban, half Afro-Cuban and half Afro-Mexican. Yeah. So he's still considered a person of color at that time. I mean, obviously now he is, but... All three of them. And Satchel Page, he's probably signing social security checks right yeah, now. Yeah, I think he's in his, his mid to late 40s at this point. But they said they had to stay with a black family here in Tucson because yeah. they couldn't have a hotel. And they Indians had to rent them a car for, yeah. so they could get to the ballpark. It was, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous to think, like, these are your one of your top pitchers, one of your top hitters, and they're just like, well, we can't have you staying with the team. Yeah, I mean, like, hey, could you just, like, not eat at this restaurant? Exactly. <laughs> Damn it, Tucson. Hey, everybody. Just want to take a quick break to uh, let you know that our Sports Experience podcast is brought to you by Engel Studio here, and uh, they're here in Tucson for all your recording needs. The Indians have a couple aces in the hole that I really wanted to get, in, get into. One in particular is not only do they have a plan for Doby, they're going to move him to center field. Yep. They have the luxury because he's still alive, a guy who's probably in the top 10 of all time in hits and probably one of the best outfielders who ever played. Tris Speaker is teaching him how to play center field. Tris Speaker is a Hall of Famer, Indians Red Sox, one of the best players ever. I think he was even one of the guys Mr. Burns wanted to put on the team in that baseball episode. Yes. It's like, most of these people have passed on, sir. <laughs> but you're right. He essentially creates this outfielder out of him because he's been playing second base his whole life. Second base is not going to be open. A it's a completely different position. You're using completely different gloves. I mean, it's just such a hard thing to do when you've been playing your entire life in the middle infield to go and play center field, you yeah. know, John Fogarty style. But yeah. uh, the other ace in the hole that I really wanted to talk about is at this time, pardon me, at this time, the Indians have their farm director is a man by the name of Hank Greenberg. You know who Hank Greenberg is? I don't. He was a uh, first baseman for the Detroit Tigers, who's in the Hall of Fame. Okay. A fantastic power hitter. In fact, one season in the 30s for Detroit, he almost tied Babe Ruth's record for homers in a season. I think he hit 58. Wow. I mean, he was a massive power hitter. Okay. Really good player on some Detroit Tigers teams that won World Series. Back in the 30s? Back in the 30s and 40s, okay. yeah. So he, um, the thing with Greenberg, though, kind of a kindred spirit to Doby in the following way is Greenberg is Jewish and... You know, even though Jews were allowed to play and were technically white at that time, if anyone took shit, it was guys like Hank Greenberg or Joe DiMaggio, who was Italian, yep. because, you know, you're not because you can Anglo. get singled out. Yeah, yes, you get exactly. singled out. I mean, I can't I, I don't know how many hard K words Hank Greenberg heard in a lot of these American League cities, but I'm sure it was a lot. It, well, it must have been ridiculous, but this is one of the first things of integration. You yeah. know what I mean? Like. And which is kind of ridiculous to think back on. Oh, yeah. It, but Doby, I don't know what how he would have performed. I mean, obviously, talent is talent. But having guys like a Tris Speaker to teach you to play another position or somebody like a Hank Greenberg, who's your farm director, who you can talk to, probably the only person you can talk to on your team about something like that, um, was probably very beneficial. But I also think it was bringing these other black athletes with him satchel page who he knew from the eagles yeah i bet that kind of created this more of this team element i'm sure it did and i'm the indians already stacked at this time you're just adding more talent to the that's pool. The, yeah that's the other thing is that they're just like a great team man that american league must have been really great at that time and this is a time when there's no even nlcs or alcs or nlds ALDS or even wild card playing games. Yep. You win the pennant if you win your league. That's it. You go to the World Series. Yep. And in 48, Doby goes off. 121 games, hits 301, 14 dingers, 66 ribbies. I mean, 
Not, the team won 97 games. Their their uh, pitching rotation was stacked with Bob Lemon and Bob Feller. Bob Feller's in the Hall of Fame. Okay. The team was first in batting average, first in uh, uh, OPS, first in slugging, and first in ERA. I mean, this was a powerhouse team in 1948 for the Indians. I yeah. know you had brought it up before the show. Well, I mean, this is, if anybody remembers the Bob Euchre episode, mm -hmm. if anybody remembers Major League, this is the time in which they're referencing. Yeah. Where they're like, oh, that golden era. This is it. The, Larry this Doby's is it. era. You know what I mean? Like, and then they sing that song about Cleveland. I'm not going to try and sing it. But oh, <laughs> big real. Randy Newman. Yep, Randy Duba Newman. Duba. Shot God, I people. love when Randy Newman comes on. But <laughs> Lady yes. walking. <laughs> this is what they're referencing because the Indians were great in this era and then decided to stop learning how to decided to stop playing baseball for well, a while. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll get into it later is it, they didn't really hit the shits is they were finishing like second and third every year in the AL. And yes. if they played now, they'd be in the playoffs every year up until really the late 1950s, early 1960s. Yes. You know, but only one team gets to only go. Only one team gets and to go. In it's 1948, that's the Indians yeah. and they go to the World Series. And guess who plays his ass off in the World Series? He has a great World Series. And they're playing the 1948 Boston Braves. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of towards the tail end. They have a really, um, you know, they have a really good team. Eddie Matthews is on this team, Warren Spahn. But, you know, this is the era I know we had talked about in our baseball episode. Baseball towns with two teams that aren't New York and Chicago are kind of struggling if you're playing second fiddle. Teams like the St. Louis Browns, like the Boston Braves, teams, you know, kind of like that. Yeah. So um, in the 48 World Series, uh, Doby makes history, not only by hitting 318, he had a home run in game four. Yep. He's the first black player to hit a home run in a World in Series. In a World Series. Not Jackie Robinson. Exactly. Larry Doby. <laughs> but uh, no, the, the series went six games, and uh, the Cleveland Indians... Won a, won a World, World Series. Series. <laughs> Doesn't that feel weird to say? Yeah. Um, granted, this was, uh, what, 73 years ago? Yeah. Seven, it's been a it's been a 73 years of rebuilding for this franchise, I believe. But uh, no, they, they win the World Series, and Larry Doby is a key cog on that World Series team. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine how, like, euphoric it felt for him to do that. Oh, my God. And then... It, it, one of the most iconic pictures of this era is him and the second baseman who I'm, spa I'm spacing. Joe Gordon. Joe Gordon. I was about to say I got Josh Gibson. I'm just like, nope, that's not <laughs> it. Because, um, you know, you look at your notes. Yeah, but him and Joe Gordon hugging, and he said that did so much for race relations. Yeah. Because you could see these two guys who literally don't care what race they are. They are just teammates winning this World Series, and they're just in pure joy. It is really a great picture of them. Oh, no, it's it's a terrific picture. And just to think, like, how great that must have felt for Bill Vec, too, to be like, you know, our team's I'm knocking right. on the door. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm right, bitches. I might, I might do some weird, kooky shit every now and then, but you know what? I care about winning games, and I care about improving the sport, and that's yeah. what he did. And I to think after how difficult 47 must have been for him, and I'm sure his entire career was difficult, obviously. But as far as, you know, going places oh. and getting razzed and being called horrible things and having horrible things done to him, just how good it must have felt to be like, I'm right. I'm not playing second base or shortstop. I'm the starting center fielder for I, the Cleveland effing Indians. I know. Which is another topic we can talk about. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, one, of the, one of the instances that he said always stuck with him that he almost – attacked the other player because there were a couple that there were a bench clearing brawl um was that he slid into second and the shortstop came and just spit on him spit tobacco juice on him yeah like, spitting on someone is shitty to begin with like it's a big like life no-no yeah but when you got like a plug of red man in and you're spitting it on a guy that it was so he said it was just so messed up and that he just walked away and it was the one of the only times where he was just like I can't believe I walked away himself saying that to, you know, himself. Like, I can't believe I walked away from that. But you know what? It's it's guys like Branch Rickey and Bill Veck. I'm sure that they when they were scouting players to integrate the American and National Leagues is I'm sure a lot of it, even though they probably didn't have, you know, medical testing. I'm sure they met like for psychology and shit. I'm sure they yes. met with all these players and were like, 
what are you going to do when this happens? Because it's going to happen. Yes. Like, spitting on anyone is terrible. Spitting on a guy because he fucked your wife? Okay. I can understand that. But spitting on a guy for doing nothing wrong and having characteristics that they can't control is the biggest like piece oh, of shit move. It's like, such a fucking ridiculous. Oh my God. Um, something else that I saw um, for black players of this era was they got brushed back eight and a half times yep. more than any other the top white player getting brushed back. So the, and this is back when they would throw at your fucking head. And, and yeah, and because pitching inside was a reality. I it mean, was a it reality. Was some, it was something you had to live with. Yep. I mean, that's just the way baseball was played at that time. But they were being specifically targeted, and I think we all know why. And the other thing was you couldn't turn around and complain to the ump. So the umps throughout series or throughout different places yeah. were racist. Oh, exactly. So yeah. he was talking about there would be like balls like way outside and it would just be a strike and he would just be like, oh, this guy's racist. Damn it. That's the kind of day it's going <laughs> to yeah. be. All and right. I'm going to have to hit some uh, hit some off my shoelaces today. Exactly. Let's see, let's see what we, we have can to do. Kirby Puckett these out of here. <laughs> but that's the thing is like he literally would have to adapt like the shortstop's racist today. You know what I mean? Or like oh, yeah. the third base umpire's racist today. You know, like he just constantly had to adapt to these to this absolute ridiculous but he constantly constantly kept hitting for the indians and he he takes it all in stride and even though post 1948 they only win one pennant up through 1955 when he's in his prime he is straight up raking i was gonna say he is straight up raking like he led RBI the bi master <laughs> and he got on base like he yeah. led the league in on base percentage in ops in 1950 he led the league in runs um and it led the league in home runs and slugging percentage like how in in during that era i mean he led the league in home runs and then in 1954 yep 1954 which up until 1995 was cleveland's last pennant winning team yeah and they reference it again with randy newman in major league 1954 that's a big year because he leads the league in home runs home runs and rbi and rbis for the american league which and is like likely should have been the MVP, but let's be honest. Yep. Like I looked at that, and the numbers were very similar. Mm -hmm. um, I forget who even the MVP was that year, but you can kind of tell that if it was a close race, Larry Doby was going to lose. Yeah, and it was during the span where he made all seven of his All-Star games in a yes, row. Yes, seven in a row, which I love that. Literally from 47 to 55. and Or 40, yeah. And nine. mind you, in the American League at this time, you have Mickey Mantle playing center field for the Yankees. Yep. Like, I mean, this is not an easy thing to do, especially playing in a market like Cleveland, especially when you're not white. <laughs> well, let's get more into that because he gets fined for stealing home yep. against the Yankees, which yeah. if you, I mean, and then the commissioner comes out and was just like, well, uh, it wasn't biased, but you're just like, why would you find somebody for stealing home? Because it was a reckless play is what. Yeah, a yeah. reckless play, which is old white man speak for saying, know your place, you know what. <laughs> yes, no, seriously, though. And that's what I feel like they constantly were beating these guys down. And luckily, we had these guys like Larry Doby, like Jackie Robinson, like Satchel Paige to come out and essentially win, uh, uh, to keep playing and keep winning. Yeah, but I mean, one more thing I wanted to get into, because this is his prime window. I was going to say like, th this. This, is, this yes. is where he's becoming a star, becoming one of the better power hitters, despite what Hank Greenberg, he tried to dock him pay because he wasn't hitting enough home runs. It's just insane. Which is a whole Especially other... Especially in this era. And a lot of it came out of, he worked with a uh, track coach during the offseason because he was getting hampered by leg injuries. Yes. And they helped him do calisthenics and stuff before games, which really improved his physical health. Yes. But during this era, he's hitting 286 with 188 homers, 663 RBIs, a three uh, over a 300 on base percentage and slugging 505. That's just in absolutely insane. Yeah. No, he, he was really one of the best hitters of the American League in that in that era. Oh, totally. And there's a great picture of him at an All-Star game. Um, obviously, there he's on the American League team, but the Dodgers, in addition to Jackie Robinson, they also had Roy Campanella and uh, Don Newcomb on their team. Yep. Both black. Well, Newcomb was black. Campanella was half Italian, half black. But, yeah, there's a picture of all of them together to be like, go fuck yourselves, owners. Well, I think in that 
um, that year, that was four out of the six black players. And yeah. And Larry Doby came out and said that if you're black and you want to play in the major, if you want to play in Major League Baseball, you have to be great. If yeah. you're white, you, you just have to be good. You just have to show up if you're white, basically, yeah. especially during this particular time period. Which is a, such a great statement for that era. You didn't see utility black players whatsoever. You saw... You know, only great players. Yeah, the, they had to be stars. They had to be stars. Because they're not going to carry you if you can't perform because things could get ugly quickly and yep. all that other All that other jargon. Nonsense. But uh, another Let's, milestone in that 54 All-Star game I wanted to bring yep. up. He hits a pinch hit homer to tie the game at nine in the eighth inning, which the AL goes on and wins. But not Jackie Robinson. Larry Doby is the first black player to hit a home run in an all-star game. And they say that this was the best all-star game for like 50 years. Oh, yeah, no. Because it's like one of the only ones that was high scoring, and then they pinch him in in the eighth, and he ties it up, and then they go on to win like 11-9. And yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's so, he has so many great moments that, that nobody knows that nobody that knows nobody knows and that's why i want to do an episode on i know him. i to be honest i was pretty fuzzy on him like i remember when he brought up his name i was like i know that name and then you started talking about it, i was like i know exactly who that is and it just didn't register right away and that's a problem and i'll tell you what it doesn't register for most people probably outside of cleveland and chicago because yeah. nobody knows they're making movies about jackie robinson they're retiring his number across the league and yeah, there was another guy, too. <laughs> I was going to say, which I, I agree with in the National League. Yes. It should have been different in the American League. Absolutely. But that, you know what? That, but uh, after 55, um, not to say everything was well, so nice in Cleveland. Hold on, hold on. So they you want to do the 54 World Series? Yeah, yeah, so they lose the 54 World Series, but who was? New York Giants. And then who was on that team? Monty Irvin was on that team. Just to bring it all the way back. So and. Willie Mays was on that. And that, Willie Mays. That, that, that World Series, if you don't know, um, has the iconic photo because of the iconic play in, I believe, Game 1, where Willie Mays makes his basket catch at the polo grounds, back turned completely to the plate. Vic Wirtz hits a bomb, which yep. would have gone out in center field in any other park, but the polo grounds dimensions are wonky. We could do a whole episode on that shit show of a stadium. Yep. But uh, but yeah. he, he basket catches he ba it. just basket catches it and then whips around and throws it. it, it that it, was the moment where that series was lost. Like Cleveland could do nothing. They won over a hundred games that year. Yeah, under I think Al they, Lopez. yeah, like one hundred and ten or something. It's crazy. One hundred and eight. One hundred and eight. Yeah, one hundred eight yeah. games they won, and all the air came out of the balloon after that play. Is what everybody says. Yep. And when you look at how the series played out, it it did. Like, Every time I see that catch, though, I always think of that. Major League. Yep. He comes back in, he gives him the handshake. Don't ever fucking do that again. Nice catch, Hayes. Yeah. Don't ever fucking do it again. <laughs> uh, you think that guy was a smoker? <laughs> no, James Gammon, you treasure. Rest in peace, sir. But uh, yeah, so 55 is his last season in Cleveland. And this whatever. is where injuries, I think, really catch up to him yeah and the media starts getting on his ass that which too is, is bullshit there was a quote after he is uh traded uh october 25th so like right after the season he's traded to uh the white Sox, and uh a man named franklin lewis at the cleveland plane dealer said uh well some not so nice uh not so nice things uh about him uh calling him sullen and surly and like how a loner a loner yeah it's like why would you say that? Like, were you in the locker room every yeah. day? Were you were you batting and people dropping hard R's every like two seconds while you're in the batter's box? It, like, it's pretty ridiculous the mindset of the sports writers to think like, oh, this guy's not shucking and driving for me. Yeah. Essentially, it, it's it's really sad because he was a great baseball player that the media really outside. I feel like in Cleveland they loved him because they even gave him the the uh, baseball man of the year. Yeah. Um, I think in 54. And, uh -huh. um, but you see once he gets traded and goes, cause he starts kind of bouncing around. Yeah. He kind of, I mean, his prime is essentially uh, yes. done. I mean, he's still an effective player. It's just like that window of awesomeness is over. Just like any player who gets up in age. Yep. But uh, Doby had a great quote in response to it where he said, I was looked on as a black man, not a human being. How fucked up is that? It's so ridiculous. Like, how how ridiculous is that? And there's, you know, he goes even further into it, but, like, he talks about, look, I can remember all the shit that I took, but I remember the good guys like my friend Joe Gordon. Yep. Like, he had 
the perfect attitude like Jackie Robinson did to not fight back, to have that self-control, to be like, this is just the way it is. All I can do is play ball and thank God that there are decent people out there who don't care and just want to play baseball or just want to watch me play baseball. Yeah. I wonder if he, he really had a conscious thought that like this is going to change it for the future because especially with all the conversations he had with Jackie, I bet they were just constantly talking about what major league baseball would be like in a decade, you know, or like, you know, yeah. that kind of thought. And, but, but it's over the course of his prime. And I think he's just as important as Jackie Robinson in this regard is that you start seeing more black stars coming into the game. Yep. Teams that had no black players are finally starting to put them on their roster and go like, Oh shit, these guys can play. Um, we'd better get them. So nobody else can, Yeah, you know? And I think the, the last team to integrate eventually, and I think it's the year after Dobie retired, ended up being the Red Sox in 1960. They surprise, were, surprise. Yeah. So Tom Yaki, <laughs> rotten hell, you piece of shit. But, um, <laughs> Anyway, he um, goes to the White Sox in 55 and he can still play, or in 56 and he can still play. Yep. And this is when you see under Al Lopez, who was his manager in Cleveland, and they eventually go to the World Series without Dobie in 1959, but in 56 and 57, they finish third and then second in the American League. So they're an ascending young team and Dobie's kind of like that veteran, you know, cog in that entire uh, operation. Yeah, definitely that veteran center fielder that can bring a, a team together. Yeah, and he ended up playing, I think, first base for them too. Somewhat. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then uh, his last good season was in 58 because he's traded back to Cleveland. Yep. And this is kind of before everything completely napalms for that franchise for an, about four decades. Now, I was wondering if they kind of traded him back as almost like a swan song, like his goodbye, but he looked... He, he played effectively. Played, 58 yes. was like the last year where he was like a good player. Yes. Like I, I shouldn't say good. He's always been good, but an effective player, an like effect, someone yeah, who could like play that. every day and yep. do things like that. Cause in 59, right before, like during spring training, he's traded to the tigers yep. for one of the pieces was Terry Francona's dad, oddly enough. All right. And then, uh, by May of that year, he's sold to, uh, the white Sox. So he's going back to the white Sox, but he can't crack the roster. So he goes and plays for the San Diego Padres, not, the San Diego Padres we know now, but the old Pacific Coast League Padres where guys like the minor league team where guys like Ted Williams and Bobby Doerr played, you know, that was like the elite minor league league of that time, you know, because DiMaggio played on the San Francisco and his brothers played on the San Francisco teams. There was Los Angeles teams. I mean, basically all of the California cities that have major league baseball teams now, they all had minor league teams before. Yep. They decided to give them franchises, but he uh, fractured his ankle sliding into second base yeah. during one of the games, and that kind of ended his career. Yeah. Well, it ended his career in Major League Baseball, but I want to bring this up before we get into his coaching. He actually goes to Japan. Yeah, with uh, Don Newcomb, with I believe. Don Newcomb, and yeah. they say Shunichi that— Shunichi Dragons. They say that they integrated baseball there and yeah. made it— because baseball was becoming really popular, and— to get X stars to come and play in Japan, they said it was a big boost for them. Japan has weird rules, though. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them on their teams. You can only have a certain number. I don't know what the number is. A foreign. But in their league, yeah, you can only have a certain number of foreign players. And yeah. by foreign, I mean not Japanese. Yes. So. I, I, and the only reason why I know that is from that movie, Mr. Baseball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was the same team that he went to, the Chinichi yeah, Dragons. I yeah. know. You got a hole in your swing. I just want to bring up, even though this is about Larry Doby, God bless your mustache, Tom Selleck. Oh, God. How can you not bring up that mustache? Magnum P. Yeah, but uh, all right, that's it. I'm turned on. <laughs> God damn it, Tom. All right, so this is <laughs> so this is the end of his playing career. This is the end of his playing his career. He uh, over his career, he hit 283, 1515 hits, 253 home runs, and uh, 970 runs batted in. Well, world championship, world a championship, seven-time All Stars, yep. couple AL home run titles. I'll tell you what, I love the seven-time All Star because it's seven consecutive in and, center field. And I know we brought this up, AL. <laughs> this was the golden era of baseball. That's what I mean. This is what everyone refers to, and yet everybody wears forty-two and not fourteen. Yep, we're both. 
to me, we're both. This guy is just as important in groundbreaking. Like, I didn't see Jackie Robinson playing at Fenway. No. The only AL city I saw uh, Jackie Robinson playing in was New York at Yankee Stadium in the World Series. That's it. I didn't see him going, you know, on road trips to Comiskey Park. Like, no. Larry Doby should, is just should be as given, important. Yeah. He, he's gotten the short end of the stick. And I think a lot of it is he was such a humble man. He never ever showed anything publicly or even privately where he was jealous of Jackie Robinson. Yeah. He, was he always felt like, yeah, yeah. He was, they were good friends and, and really for the same kind of cause. Um, Absolutely. So he's coaching around major league. I know he coaches for the Indians for a while. And uh, I want to bring this up because he was almost in line to become the first black manager. Yeah, which ended up being Frank Robinson which with the Indians when he was first base coach. He just can't get away from these Robinsons. No, man. I mean, geez. But uh, no, he's uh, with the White Sox and with Bill the White Vex, Sox. who owns them, yep. lets him coach, like, lets him be a manager. I was going to say, he almost like lets him take over the season where you can kind of see the season was going down. Yeah, it was more or less like, just just finish this out. We'll decide what to do. And then after the season when they don't renew his contract, he's still involved in the front office. Yep. Like I know he was a scout and a coach for the Expos. He was involved with the Indians. He was involved with the White Sox. I mean, he's just definitely in baseball. Always around baseball. And, you know, he has that name recognition. Yeah. But, but it should be more so. Yeah. Bob Feller had a great quote. Um, one of his teammates uh, with the Indians who's in the Hall of Fame, just like Doby. He said, uh, Larry was a great American. He served his country in World War II. But he was a great ball player. He was kind. Um, he was kind of like Buzz Aldrin, second man on the moon. I like that a lot. Yeah, second man. I mean, because he was. He was the second second uh, baseball player, second manager. He was always the second man in baseball. And he just, but he loved baseball so much, and yes. he always stuck around. That eventually, over time, you know. Did he put up necessarily the aggregate Hall of Fame stats? Probably not, but he was so dominant in that window that eventually, by 1998, he's recognized by the Veterans Committee, yes. and they vote him into the Hall of Fame, yeah. which was long overdue and much deserved. I don't know if you watched his Hall of Fame speech. I did. Wasn't as comical as Bob Euchre, let's just say that, but he just thanked everyone who you know he thanked his family he thanked his teammates you thanked know his wife thanked and, his wife and his kids and yep. his grandkids i mean just an all-around stand-up guy family man just thankful for everything that was provided to someone who grew up in south carolina like at a time when being that way in south carolina wasn't good yeah or considered good he um one other thing i wanted to add was he at the end of his speech and he was very proud of this he had said, oh, and by the way, um, I received the news. Ted Williams called me. That's awesome. Like a legend of the game that yeah. you played against, you know. But on... that's what, how much he loved baseball. Yeah. was like he was just like, you guys won't believe this. Ted Williams just called me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like, ah, that's awesome. Ted Williams was the one that let me know that I'm, that I'm part of the club. But uh, he was kind of in failing health, yes. you, know, in, you know, very soon afterwards. Um, he had uh, kidney issues, ended up having kidney cancer. And then uh, June 18th, 2003, he died in Montclair, New Jersey, where uh, he was actually neighbors with Yogi Berra and his family. Wow, I didn't like, know their that. Their kids played together wow. when they were younger. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he he's almost like a Forrest Gump of baseball. You know, all these little spider webs yep. and everything that he's involved with. But uh, Larry Doby, God bless you, sir. You uh true American hero. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, everybody, this is just a stock message at the end of every episode. We hope you enjoyed whatever athlete and or team that that episode was about. Just want to say give us a quick follow on all social media. We have a YouTube channel, the Sports Experience Podcast, and we're on Instagram, the Tolo Dominic and myself, C. Quinn Comedy. So give us a follow all around. Um, we're always recording right here at Angle Studio. Thank you all very much.